Welcome back to another episode of the We Love to Build podcast. This is episode 137 with Nick Spiller. Nick is a venture principal at Capital Factory in Austin, Texas, based seed stage venture capital firm. Nick also coaches startups on how to raise money and has assisted them in uh, raising money. Capital Factory has helped 750 plus portfolio companies raise billions in venture capital to date. I was interested in talking with Nick because of his experience uh, as a fundraiser and uh, an investor, and I thought it would be quite interesting, especially because he's in Austin, where a lot of startups have moved from uh, Silicon Valley since COVID, and so I thought it would be cool to know more about how Austin has changed from that and um, you know what he sees going on and how he sees the world and, and its evolution uh, into 2023. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Nick. I appreciate it. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit more and tell everyone how you got into uh, working with Capital Factory and we'll go from there. Thanks, Sean. Happy to be on the show. Appreciate you inviting me on and we'll get to talk a little bit about what we do with startups here at Capital Factory. A uh, long time ago, I grew up a long ways from Texas and a small town outside of Flint, Michigan. Uh, and when I graduated in 2009, the, the recession had its, its grips on my, my, my state and I ended up leaving and, and, and you know, went to Texas and really discovered a amazing place when, when I did and for a lot of different reasons. And, and for me specifically, it was just such a entrepreneurial culture, uh, deeply rooted in Texas and, uh, you know, maybe historically a different philosophy on business than, than Silicon Valley, but, but nonetheless, Texas is the uh, ninth largest economy in the world compared to different countries. Uh, and we have four of the top 10 largest cities in the United States, uh, all within a day's drive of each other in Texas. And so it's a great place to build a business. And for the last 10 years at Capital Factory, we've been uh, building a startup ecosystem really across the state of Texas and getting ready to drive up from Austin to Dallas right after this podcast to you know, attend a launch party for one of our portfolio companies and be in San Antonio later this week as well. And so I spent a lot of my time traveling across the state and getting to know every entrepreneur, every investor, and managing a team of associates that, that helps us uh, get the job done. Definitely sounds like a lot of work. I don't envy you for that at all. Although I do love meeting different people, which is one of the reasons why I do the podcast. I get to meet you and I don't have to go to Texas to do so. Um, so I've been to Austin, um, and one of my best friend's parents live in Houston now. They uh, lived in Miami for a long time. So I'm a little bit familiar with it. I think I was there in 2018, either 2017 or 2018. Um, great fun. Austin's a really cool, vibrant city. I always thought to myself, if I ever decided that I uh, had an inkling to move back to America, which I don't, um, I would consider Austin as a place I would want to live. I mean, I felt that way for the last few years. Then again, I haven't really seen too much of the U.S., maybe like 10 of the 50 states, so don't have much to go on, um, although, uh, yeah, Austin was pretty cool. So I'm, I'm curious, what makes you excited about working with startups? Yeah, I think there's a lot that gets me excited, uh, and, and, you know, I think over, over time it's less excitement and more purpose that really, really drives me. Because um, actually a lot of times startups are – the opposite of exciting they're they're a big pain in the ass and you got you know interesting co-founders with with you know ambitious views on the world that that don't align with investors who want to get their their money back and protect their interests and you know there's all kinds of things that go wrong in startups i've learned and, and uh but but really it's about making an outsized impact on the world and, and you know the history shows us that small teams are the ones that really make a difference and, and, and you know, create solutions at scale. Uh, and, and, you know, startups are the modern day manifestation of that. So I choose to be involved and, and you know, here in, here in Austin, where most of us or a lot of us are Longhorns and University of Texas at Austin, our slogan is what starts here changes the world. And I think that's a big, big part of the, the purpose that I get, get involved with uh, startups for. You said small teams make a difference. If small teams are better at making a difference than large teams and large companies, why are small teams pushed to grow so big and so fast? It's a good question. I, I 
we'll speak to venture funded startups specifically. Um, you know, and there's a lot of other types of small teams, whether it be a nonprofit or just a project or, you know, any, any other type of group, but a, a venture funded startup is predicated on, on outsized returns as well as outsized impact. Right. And, and, you know, meaning this is the riskiest asset you could invest in a startup, startup company on the, the spectrum of, assets to invest in, you know, startups are, you know, the highest chance of losing your money, but it's also because of that, the highest chance that, that you'll, you'll, you know, get a huge return. And so, um, it's, it's the investors who fund these, these companies that you know, they need to generate high growth to justify, uh, a 10 X, 100 X return on their investment in these companies to go raise money for their next fund. Right. And it's like a lot of these investors, they're raising money too. And so, you know, they need to see you grow. They need to at least see your valuation get marked up on paper by raising additional funding because that's the information they're going to go to their investors, their limited partners, their LPs uh, to try to raise their next fund. And so that drives this, this growth cycle. Um, and, and, and yeah, and so without the need to grow or the, the, the impetus to become super big, you wouldn't be able to attract the funding it takes to develop the technologies and the startups in the, the, the first place and, and, you know, win the markets uh, that, that you need to do. So, so yeah, I think that's the, the key, key driver. You mentioned something in your last response about valuation uh, and increasing and through fundraising. I've spoken to... You're, you're like my 120 something guest so far. The majority of the people I've talked to have never raised a single dollar from outside. And their focus, as they would say to me, is making sure their customers are happy and being profitable in the process. I've seen that a lot of investors are excited about the idea of their portfolio companies raising the next round in order to increase their valuation. But what we've seen over the last decade or more is that raising funds doesn't always equate to they have become profitable or they are profitable. And there have been a number of companies that have gone public where they're not profitable yet. Do you think this is something that's going to change or do you see this idea of pushing for new funding in order to increase the valuation uh, to continue to be more important, to continue to be the most important thing? Or do you see that changing because of COVID or, or AI? Or Using the crystal ball, I'd say certainly profit, profitability will increase uh, in value to investors generally as we enter a more recessionary environment. All right, and that's kind of the expectation going into this year is by the time we're going out of this year, there will be uh, a, a recession. And at the same time, I, you know, at, at the end of the day, the profits don't mean returns for investors, right? Not necessarily, right? And especially investors who need to 10, 20 X their, their investor, their, their investment. You know, it's really it's about the enterprise value, right? And so you, you know, you have a lot of value in a company. Just say Facebook without any revenue, just all everyone's data, everyone's interaction on there. Maybe Facebook's out, outdated, but you know, a social media with platform where every human in in, in, in the U.S. or in the world is, is on it, even though they have no no revenue, no profits, doesn't mean it's not super valuable. Something that you could sell to another individual or another company. Uh, for, for more. And so it's, uh, yeah, I think there's three buckets in which investors value companies. They value your, your cash flows, your, your revenue, your profits. Uh, they value your, your data and you know, your, your customer information and, and you know, everything, the data surrounding that. And they, they value your technology your product and how differentiated it is, how hard it is. And so, you know, it's kind of a balancing act between those three buckets of how you're, you're, you're valuing a company. Uh, and then also, you know, the, the macro environment around that, which is what's been so tricky these last few years as, as everything's shifted uh, under the feet of entrepreneurs as they 
you know, are going from one round to another, the, the, the environment they're raising money in and that, that subsequent round has been quite, uh, you know, it's, it's quite different than, than when they raised the first round of capital. Could you put a percentage change in what you've seen trending for fundraising between the last year and now in terms of whether it's an up round or a down round or how much they're raising, whether they're raising less, they're raising more, and, and if their valuations are going up or down? I felt like last year was the, the, the weighted out year and you know companies either had enough money to, to not raise last year and will look to raise this year. I think with the hopes that it would be a better environment, although it doesn't seem like it's it's looking out to be that way. Um, you know, and, and co- companies now have you know re- reversed from this COVID path, right? Where you're raising money in an incredible environment, all online, and and now they're you know doing it in person in a, in a tough environment and you know and it's, it's really tough to say and so you know companies either didn't raise or they did a flat round where they didn't have to do a down round um you, you know and they just raised an, an extension of their last round at the same terms so that's you know, a good good you know, relatively good opportunity for investors um you know and this year that you know that it's going to get harder and harder to do that. Right. And especially as, you know, assuming the, the, the fundraising environment doesn't bounce back, which it doesn't look like it will, like companies will start to do down rounds. You'll start to see recapitalizations of the company uh, and, and probably a lot of other creative things um, to really prevent those two things. Um, right. And like, that's the last thing you, know, you really want is, you know, to have to go mark down a company in your portfolio as an investor, because then that marks your whole portfolio down and, and, you know, makes it harder for you to raise money. Um, you know, and so I think it's going to get tougher and tougher and, and there's a lot of companies scheduled to go out of business this year for sure. If they don't find a solution to this problem. What are some things startups can do to make themselves look more attractive to investors in this environment, preferably without having to do that down round. I think as, as much as you can grow into your britches as a, a company, the, the better. And so you know, I, you know, really focusing on growing your customers and your product and you know everything you know, outside of the fundraising will, will make fundraising easier and really prepare you for the time that, that the market comes back and you know it's the classic conundrum you know when you're running out of money and you're trying to fundraise as an entrepreneur you feel like this is very important you really you know we're doing something interesting you know it, you, know, you can make a big difference by investing in the company you know we won't go out of business we won't lose it won't run out of runway but really that's the last thing an investor wants to hear investors don't want to invest in companies that are running out of money or don't have any money. They want to invest in companies that don't need to raise money because that's the safest opportunity. And so I think, you know, as soon you, you put yourself in a position where you can raise money to take advantage of a market opportunity, but you can also operate indefinitely if you don't. And, and that puts you in a position of power to where you really don't need the fundraising and that will actually you know, make you a more attractive investment for for the the companies and i you know and generally i'd be looking you know how do you position yourself 12 24 months from now right it's like that's you know sometime between 12 and 24 months you know maybe 36 months is when you know the, the economy should start to come back and you know, you'll you, you want to time it so you're ready to go when, when that happens what you said reminds me a lot of like dating I, I don't know if you've heard these kinds of analogies before, but I think business and dating are very similar uh, where like uh, the best analogy I can give to that is um, if you're already in a relationship, other women will know whether they know you or they, they see you on the street, they kind of like know you're already in a relationship and that's when you're more attractive is because you're unattainable. You're harder to get. Everybody wants what they can't get. Yeah. And then once we get, once it's easy to get something, we we take advantage of it or we take uh, take it for granted. You know, kind of like water, right? So uh, you know, air, these super important things that you know, we don't don't pay anything for.
From your experience helping startups to fundraise, what do you think is the most difficult aspect of it? There's a couple buckets. You know, I think for a lot of people, it's building deep trust with the investors. And, you know, and, and ultimately trust overrides anything else in an investment decision. And if they don't trust you, it doesn't matter what your paper says, what your historic history says, what your track record is. If it's untrustworthy, they're not going to give you a couple million dollars to build your company. Right. We know how that turns out. Um, you know, but more practically, it's just really it's like, you know, people get stuck at that first interaction and. Uh, you know, you, there's a reason these charismatic folks become successful, right? Your Steve Jobs, your, you know, um, you know, Elon Musk, right? Like, cause they're charismatic and they've got that, that, that just, you know, energy that people dive into and you meet them and you want to get to know more about what they're doing and you want to be a part of what they're doing. And there's a lot that goes into why that is, but. You know, I think it's it's there's you know a certain set of people that are charismatic and, and can build trust quickly because of that. Um, I think the the rest of everyone else who frankly are probably just as good, if not better, business operators and and, and operators um, that just aren't quite as charismatic and can't can't uh, you know woo the investor into you know trusting them with their their capital. Yeah, I was talking to someone the other day, best in California. He's working on a quantum computing startup. And he was explaining it to me in a way that I was like, yeah, this is really interesting. He's like, yeah, but like talking with investors is not easy. And because like they don't understand it. And it's like, yeah, I don't know what to tell you there. But what you're, you know, when you explain it to me, like, I think it's really cool but I don't have the money to invest that, you know, what you need. It only takes one investor. Another big thing is just, you know, identifying the right investors. And there's, you know, 10,000 of them out there in the U S you know, maybe, maybe, maybe a little more that are investing in startups, but really it's only a handful of those that really are, are your true uh, investors. And I think that's almost the other half of the pie is like, if you can build trust with an investor using your idea, then the other half is just finding the right investor to get in front of. And you should be, you should be there. Um, you, you know, but that doesn't, uh, it, it, yeah, I know it's not easier said than done, I guess. What do you see the investor's responsibility as being? I mean, that investor's responsibility is to steward the investment you know the key word is like the investment not the company although they're very you know intertwined obviously and the success of the company is the success of the investment investor investor most of the time although you know in some key times it's not and you know they've got to get money back to their lps if they're a if they're a VC and they have a fund. So they, you know, that's, that's their job. And their customer is not the entrepreneur. The customer is the, the, the LP, the limited partner that's investing in their fund. And the, the entrepreneur is more of a, a strategic partner for that. So, um, you know, I think investors, good investors do have a responsibility in the company um, to make introductions, to uh, you know, provide key pieces of insights. Investors get to see a lot of different, companies, a lot of different ventures. And so it's usually easy for them to help connect the dots across them and, and, you know, bring ideas from other ventures that are, that are novel into, uh, you know, another, another one in their portfolio. So I think that's a big, big piece of it to add value. But I think, you know, one thing you want to know as an, as an entrepreneur is like, Hey, they're, they're looking to make money and, and looking to get an investment back. And, and that's how this, that's how it works. So if the goal of the, entrepreneurs to attract investors to give them money so they can build a company and it's the investors goal to get a return on their investment for the people who've given them the money to put in how can entrepreneurs get investors to align with them so that they can make both of their goals successful the entrepreneurs who succeed have a deep-rooted intent to do so and and it's really something that is it's almost possessive that they need to go build this company and that you know they they know it's going to happen and it's just a matter of like who's going to do it with them um and and so i think that's a big 
a big piece that you see is just like, you know, the, 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 the founders have to have the conviction to, 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 you know, b- believe in it. And that's, what's going to motivate them and really rise above all the other BS that might come along the way. And all these little, you know, tit for tat negotiations will, will, will be far inferior to the, the broader purpose of the company. Um, and that, that you're just giving them the fuel to go do it. And so it's, yeah, it's really that mentality that I I've seen be successful. It's just, you know, we're, we're not going to lose. We don't take no for an answer. Uh, and, 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 you know, that it's, 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 it's passion, right? And like that makes you more energetic and it's, it's, you get more out of that person than if you just hire a very experienced CEO, uh, to, to run that company, right? Cause that's a you know, professional. They don't have that that deep grit to do it. So that's this unique characteristic of the founders is they've got this just, you know, mission to, to you know, build this company. How often is it that you see an investor invest after the first meeting? I think I've seen it once, like at least, I mean, thousands, like, you know, probably 10,000 interactions I've, you know, have brokered. Um, and, and so, yeah, very, very little. And was that company successful? That company is, was very successful, actually, yeah. Well, then I guess that investor made a good call. It was a group of investors. They were visiting Capital Factory. It was kind of a highly curated you know, interaction where they were coming in and they wanted to see some companies. And so we chose three companies based on their investment interest from our you know portfolio of hundreds of companies and and then put them in front of them and then they kind of in the room committed to investing but even by the way even then like that's as fast as it goes it's still like it's not like they invested in the room because they hadn't seen the legal documents you know and like you can like once the legal documents come out you know there's a lot more that you need to go through and that you know just takes takes time and but it did happen so that that company uh you know, they, that investment did go through and then they raised uh, the, the company's Aptronic. It's a really cool humanoid robotics company. They work with the, the military and industry to, to build human-like robots. And they raised a, a $15 million seed round last year and are going out to raise a big A round. I would also add that, you know, they, that group of investors were not professional investors. It was more of like, a group of wealthy business people that were on vacation in Austin and like getting together and like, this is what they do for fun. Um, you know, and I was, you know, they, they took it seriously, but it was, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think it, it, there are stories I hear of like VCs, like preempting, sending super fast term sheets. I know that happens on, on the coast. I just, you know, I don't know how much it really happens. Um, I you know, definitely haven't seen it personally much. What are some of the mistakes that founders make in preparing to talk to investors? Well, one, they don't prepare. I think it's like, you know, I, you know, you should know like everything you can know about the investor you're talking to. Like I, you know, I've had founders show up for meetings that we've set up that don't know who they're meeting with, you know? And like, I feel like a lot of founders get, they like overpack their schedule. So they walk into everything blind and they're not very effective in the meetings. Um, and so, you know, like every investor I'm meeting with, I'm, I'm at least reading through all of their LinkedIn, but I'm, you know, if I have time, I'm trying to find a podcast like this or a YouTube video where they open up, they go a little deeper so I can really get inside their head, know how they think, know how they talk. Um, you know, that, that type of thing. Uh, you know, the other thing that happens, there's like this, for whatever reason, people like to bash on investors and get the like, oh, like VCs, like don't fund me. They're, you know, they think of a bunch of reasons that like VCs aren't great or investors aren't great, or they kind of like put themselves against the investors, and but they still need to raise money. And it's just like, it just comes across bad in the meetings. It's like, if you have that that undertone, like it's the investors are really good at picking up on, on like emotional cues and thoughts. And it's not like they, not that we're upset that you don't like investors, like that's kind of fine, but it's just like your attitude is not going to lead to success. Like having that type of energy with people, um, you know, and so yeah, I think you gotta, 
you got to stay very positive when you're building a startup. And, and, you know, honestly, a lot of people are going to let you down and not deliver on promises. And, you know, there's, you know, like investors in a bunch of other categories, but like the, the winners are people that can persevere through that. And you, you never know that person that let you down might really come through next time. And so like, why, why burn that bridge? Um, you know, and, and even more important than that, like, you don't want to be upset as a founder. Like you don't want to have this animosity or you don't want to be jaded because it's going to cloud your thinking and your vision and, and everything you're doing. And so you just need to like, you know, and I'm not saying they're, they're like, it's not a logical argument to not like investors. I'm sure there's a lot of reasons out there. I'm just saying it's not advantageous for the, the entrepreneur who want, who needs to raise money or wants to raise money to, you know, adopt that, that, that attitude. Cause it just, I think it's, you know, stems to just, you know, a lot of dead, dead conversations. Capital factory invests directly and finds co-investors. Yeah, that's right. We, we advise companies initially and we take a little piece of advisor equity. It's sort of like the evolution of our accelerator. And then separately we invest directly um, a lot into those companies, but also separately. Um, and we're usually, writing a hundred to two hundred thousand dollar check into an institutional seed round of a couple million up to you know fifteen million dollars. What is it that you guys look for specifically when you decide to invest in a startup? We're very big on Texas. Ninety eight percent of our companies are based in Texas. The ones who aren't have a very strong tie here. So that's you know from a thesis standpoint probably what's most unique about us and you know i don't think there's anyone who's in more texas startups than us i'm you know, probably by almost an order of magnitude um you know beyond, beyond that is everyone that's easy to know uh we really like to look for good technology that needs help fundraising right like we we can help and we can bring the network like it's great to see you know the well-developed technology with a strong team that just hasn't been plugged in because that's what we can do and make a bunch of connections to customers and investors and partners so, so that's a big big thing for us um you know and we're really agnostic from a stage and sector standpoint, although we, we do very well with deep tech, uh, you know, robotics, AI, drones, uh, because we have strong partnerships with the US Department of Defense. Uh, I'm actually right outside the, the room I'm in right now is the Army Applications Lab, which is the startup sourcing department for the Army and also have the Air Force, the Texas Military Department, a handful of other government innovation groups embedded in our ecosystem and our companies have received over half a billion dollars in non-dilutive funding from these dod groups uh since 2019 so so that's just an area we can really help well so if you like have a really deep tech you know drone or something and you're looking to plug in with uh, uh any of the, the military groups or the government groups um, we can be a really good partner on that and um yeah, so that's been a big, big piece of it. And again, I think there's a lot of other stuff I said in this episode that we're looking for, you know, the, the, the charisma and the trust and, and that. And so it's, it really is a whole, whole, uh, you know, list of, of items that we're, you know, we like to see. I've spoken to a number of Israeli entrepreneurs and oftentimes they end up starting to learn about tech while they're soldiers. And then they leave the force and end up starting technology companies to commercialize something they've worked on with some of the other people in their squads. And then Western companies go over and try to buy the tech because it's cheaper than trying to make it like Microsoft um, is a huge, uh, has a huge innovation center out there. It's interesting how the U.S. looks at it differently where I get the sense that there isn't really that, like, once you're in the Army, let's, like, teach you how to do a bunch of really cool stuff, but rather use the stuff we already have and maybe the people that are building the tech for the Department of Defense, the military army, have nothing to do with being a soldier. Maybe they've never been a soldier, so they don't know how the, the you know, complex works. Would you say that's accurate? 
I don't have a good perspective on the Israel side of it. I'd, I'd say, you know, certainly to, you know, I think very, we're in a very unique spot when it comes to technology being the United States. Um, and it's, you know, I, I, I generally, I think I agree with your, your statements. Um, but what I, what, what I can say that I know is that the, the you know, the, the armed forces in, in the U S want to speed up the rate of innovation. Right. And, you know, I, I'd say here, we, we grow up with technology probably more than anywhere else in, in the world. And, and, you know, and, and I see a lot of the people who are, you know, working for these, these DOD innovation groups, Army Applications Lab, AFWorks, it's, they're kind of at the end of their career. And this is kind of like a retirement method for them. And, and, and there's inside, you know, I think what you're talking about is like, you know, doing it outside of the DOD, but this is actually, you know, groups and kind of these innovation units, which are kind of separate from the operating, you know, bases, right? And it's really thinking about where is the Army you know, the future and, and, and really connecting with all of the startup ecosystem, not just a capital factory, but all over the country and, and, you know, being able to very quickly source technology. And so I, I think, yeah, there's certainly, you know, some, I think, I think a lot of the people after they've served and a lot of the, you know, they, whether they're still active duty or they've, they've uh, rolled out, you know, they want to, you know, keep contributing to national security, uh, and, and helping our war fighters by, by yeah, advancing technology. And I can, cause and, and it is something that they care about, right. And more than anything, and just ha having been in a big, you know, institution bureaucracy, like the U S military for 20 years, trying to deal with things, get, get technology. I've heard, I've heard, you know, just war stories, horror, but like, more like horror stories of just not being able to get basic technology in the field for you know because this group's doing one thing the other group's doing another thing and they weren't really talking until you know this big situation unfolded and so they just you know and yeah i think there, there's that drive that you see a lot of folks that want to like hey let's let's step it up and yeah i think there's a lot of pressure from other countries that have have really you know advanced their technology to like make sure we we you know hold our position um at the top. Yeah, I was going to say you said that the military and Department of Defense are trying really hard to source good technology. And I I lived in China for 10 years. So I actually lived in Shenzhen for five of those years. And I know that Shenzhen is a massive raw, raw material supplier for manufacturing, not in not only just in China, but in other countries as well. I know a number of people that will make trips to Shenzhen specifically to find parts and then whether it's being, you know, manufactured in uh, the Philippines or Indonesia or Vietnam or India, uh, Mexico, what have you. Uh, oftentimes they're going to China to find those parts. So in a environment where China is trying to uh, grow and the U.S.'s goal is to contain it, how can technology companies, especially hardware companies, especially ones that want to work with the U.S. military, how can they build their tech while reducing their reliance on China for those parts or or manufacturing um, at scale? Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out with the supply chain and, and you know, I'd say the global supply chain and the geopolitical dynamics we're seeing around China. Um, you know, right now, as we're recording this, I think there's seven or eight, I don't know how many states that are outlawing TikTok, right? Because it's owned by, by, by China. I know the U.S. has already outlined the use of, uh, government use of Chinese-made drones, uh, and that's actually driving a lot of activity here. And so, yeah, I think there's... You know, you're going to see American manufacturing come back to some degree. Uh, you know, certainly a lot of the companies, especially the startups, are you know they're building their own factories and you know doing doing things themselves here now. And I think that's certainly a, a, a piece of it. And, and you know, a piece I'd love to see you know succeed. Although the, the cost implications are are hard. You know, the other place I'm watching uh, is India, right? And I think India has all of the, 
you know, necessary components to, to be a China, right. And, and, you know, all, you know, really just need to set up the, the infrastructure there and, you know, the, the, the trade relations. So, so there's, you know, and Brazil is another country, right. And, and you know, I think there's a lot of other countries that stand to, to, you know, step up and, and grow, uh, you know, to, to, to offset this. And yeah, and in general, I, I don't know, I, it feels like we've become, we were very centralized and, you know, we kind of hit this breaking point and, and the supply chain broke down, you know, the pandemic broke down, um, you know, and like the, the, this being centralized is, you know, it plays a lot into a pandemic, right? And, you know, it's just like, because everything is so centralized, we, one, we're, much more connected and it spread super quick and but also like the you know services were very hard to maintain across the board and so yeah i think you know decentralization will play a role both on the internet and within energy and critical infrastructure and, and just you know not having one canal have the potential to back up the whole chip supply of, of the united states right or something something like that so uh these are just my ideas i'm excited to see what happens it's certainly probably one of the biggest uh you know s- disruptions that's going on right now is, is you know, supply chain and, and you know the, the geopolitical dynamics from between the east and the west i've been to india i've worked with indians as co-workers as clients and there's no way india will become a china because China, despite what's happening right now with COVID, making it look like it's not organized, it's a very organized uh, country. And Xi Jinping has done a really good job of getting rid of corruption. And, you know, that's a different conversation because you could say he just got rid of all of the people who were against him. But in general, China was a, a decently corrupt and over the last few decades has become much less corrupt. And therefore, it's a lot easier for things to get done at scale. And India doesn't have that level of centralization in the government. Modi is just not a strong leader in that way. He can't guide a billion plus people to make that kind of change. Uh, You know, if you've ever been to India, it's just the street level of, of daily life is just very unorganized compared to China. And I don't think they have it in them culturally or politically to make that change. Um, but maybe that's the maybe that's what makes them unique, and maybe there is some way that they can profit off of that. I mean, they've done a great job on the IT side of um, providing a tremendous number of you know highly skilled, intelligent people who can code and do software testing and things that are very valuable to a lot of startups. Um, but in terms of manufacturing, I'm I'm not sure that they can replace a China. I think what's happening with the Chinese manufacturing is really going to become fractured across many different countries. And I I know I was living in Vietnam uh, from 2017 to 2021. And during that time, you know, Trump was uh, waging his uh, fun little war with China. And so during that time, a lot of Chinese and Japanese and Korean manufacturers moved their, um, you know, facilities to Vietnam, they invested in building new buildings or, uh, you know, buying manufacturing uh, plants that already existed and just refitting them for their own purposes. Um, and I, so I, I see Chinese manufacturing kind of uh, splintering and uh, moving across most of Southeast Asia, um, as has already been going on for the last few years. It'll be different this time around because the technology is so much further ahead, right? And wherever it goes in the future, you, know, you really, you know, to whatever degree of automation, you won't need as many employees. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think it'll certainly get, get splintered, uh, you know, across as well, but, you know, I just, I, I feel like India is a sleeping giant in, in this, in this picture and, and you know, it still sounds like a, a big opportunity for someone to go in there, um, you know, level up the workforce and, and, you know, the infrastructure and, and, and make, make it happen. Um, you know, so we'll, 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 we'll see. I think a lot of people have tried and generally failed just like i saw in china a lot of companies uh, tried to enter china because they had this idea like oh china's the largest market in the world it's super untapped i'm gonna go and sell you know a billion users on my my car or my whatever and generally they failed you know because they didn't understand how to localize themselves or they thought they were going to change china when in fact what happens is 
you have to change yourself to survive in China. And I think India might be similar in that regard. I, I don't know China, I don't know India deep enough to make that assumption like I, I can with China. Um, but the companies that survived and thrived in China were Starbucks and KFC and McDonald's and Burger King. And uh, Tesla seems to be doing quite well there as well. Disney, Disney? I think Disney's also done well. Disney's got a, a Shanghai-based... Uh, and a Hong Kong based um, like kingdom, uh, Magic Kingdom, whatever it is, the the theme parks. So there's a few companies that have really done well in China, and the rest have just gotten destroyed. Uber had to sell its its domestic uh, business because they just couldn't compete. We'll see. I don't necessarily think it will be a, a you know, American company that 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 does it. Um, but you know, I think the fact that people have tried tried again is, you know. And that's what says there's a really big opportunity here. And you know, the fact that it hasn't been done before is, uh, you know, that only makes me more excited about the opportunity. If we could tie this all up, what is your best advice for entrepreneurs in 2023? My best advice for entrepreneurs in 2023 would have to be to build out your options and you know, have multiple paths forward, I would, you know, be stacking cash uh, as much as you can and, and building runway however you can. You, you got to make the hard decisions. And, you know, I think a lot of the entrepreneurs that are in this spot, it, it probably doesn't feel like this, but they were peacetime generals, right? Now we're going into a situation where we have wartime generals, right? And you have to do layoffs and you got to make hard decisions about, you know, employee growth and customers and, you know, like, so there's a lot more hard decisions to be made ahead than there was behind us when, when everything was up and to the right. And so um, it's not going to be fun. And this is like where we're going to learn. It's not a big party and it's not just an amazing adventure and journey it's it's like it's it's tough right and but that's actually what makes it an adventure um it won't feel good but you know you're, you're going to be healthier as a company and probably as a person um you know for it for for making those hard decisions so hopefully that's helpful and uh, sean really appreciate you having me on the podcast today how can people follow up i am very reachable on linkedin uh nick spiller and ick s-p-i-l-l-e-r and we also have our own podcast at capital factory called austinpreneur that you can check out on spotify spotify or apple podcasts we'll have the links for that in the show notes so uh, thank you very much for your time and your energy. I appreciate it. Don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day.